so good evening. Welcome to the Salamanders of Bernheim presentation. Um, I'm Andrew Berry, Director of Conservation. Uh, welcome tonight to, to speak on the series about diversity uh, at Bernheim. And so we've, we've got several presentations lined up within this, uh, this series. Um, tonight, we are going to be talking about diversity within the organisms at Bernheim. So there's, there's a lot that Bernheim is doing right now um, in terms of encouraging diversity amongst the human populations, uh, the communities around Louisville, uh, the people that come to Bernheim, the people that work at Bernheim, our members, our supporters. Uh, but, but let's also not forget that diversity also exists within the forest. And um, salamanders are really um, an important and cool and overlooked uh, part of that diversity. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Bernheim is actually home to uh, the over 10 species of salamander. I'll let Jill tell you exactly how many she found. Um, but I wanted to just jump off on this presentation. Um, and let me start sharing a screen here. Bear with me for a second. And so, um, there we go. Just a second here. Okay. Okay, so if I could get a cue from somebody, can you all see the screen now? Is that up? Good, okay, excellent. Yes. So Salamanders of Bernheim. Um, of course, you all probably know this, but a little bit of background about Bernheim. Um, we are now approaching our 93rd year. Um, we were founded by the German Jewish immigrant, Isaac W. Bernheim back in 1929. Uh, we still work under the uh, directives and the vision of Mr. Bernheim. Uh, we work on nature-based education. We do over 10,000 school kids through, through our gates every year and across the forest, um, immersing them in nature and getting hands-on experience. Um, we have our 600-acre arboretum, which is an incredible place. We have over 5,000 accession woody trees and shrubs. Uh, we have a number of arts and cultural sites. You know, a lot of people think about the giants, but we've also got some incredible statues and art um, like this piece, Let There Be Light, seen at Mr. and Mrs. Bernheim's gravesite. Um, and, then, and then, of course, we've got an incredible amount of biodiversity. Um, tonight, we're here to talk about salamanders. Uh, really, there's a number of groups that are, that are important in Bernheim, from our trees to our bats, our salamanders. And they all exist within this 16,140 acre matrix of forests, grasslands. And, and really it is the, the size of the forest and the richness of the forest that is so uh, important for species like salamanders. Um, it's the water that we have, the headwater streams, the springs, the seeps, the wetlands. Um, this is a, a natural uh, beaver pond, which they're uh, uh, working down on Wilson Creek and improving habitats for reptiles, amphibians, and a whole host of other creatures. Um, and, and really bringing it all home to where kids and, and visitors and, and students are able to interact and really connect with nature. Um, that's that's our, uh, our mission. Um, and so now I wanted to, to throw it over to Jill Fisk and let her get started. So I met Jill, oh, it's probably been three or four years now uh, when they approached us um, from Kentucky State University there in Frankfurt, one of our historically uh, black colleges, um, about doing a project around salamanders and also the impacts of recreation on salamanders. Um, Jill is originally from Northwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, she grew up surrounded by the Allegheny National Forest. Um, she was a, uh, a, a Navy CB. So the CBs are a group of the uh, Na the Navy that goes out and does engineering projects, and I'm proud to, to announce also that my grandfather was a CB in World War II, so that touches a special part of my heart. Um, she's got her, um, uh, she moved to Kentucky in 97. She got her bachelor's at Kentucky State University in Environmental Studies, and now with this project with Salamanders, she's rapidly approaching the finish of her master's in science, Kentucky State University, also in, in environmental studies. So let's welcome Jill Fisk. Thank you for agreeing to be here tonight. And, um, and let's see what she's got for us. Thanks, Andrew. Oh, and, right. oh what I'm gonna do is, is stop sharing screen here really quick. Okay, yep. 
Yep. Thanks. Okay. Right, go ahead and sorry folks, it's a little 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 tough on the transition here. Um yeah, give me one second here. So share screen two. Okay. All right. So can everybody see that screen? See it. Looks good. Okay. All right. Great. So That's thanks, great. Andrew. And like he said, oh, everybody hear me okay? So as Andrew said, this is my thesis research uh, focusing on forest recreation and the impacts of hiking trails on soil erosion, water quality, and salamander populations in Kentucky. So this project focuses on hiking trail water crossings and documenting the impacts on natural ecosystems. Salamanders are a big part of this research as they are often used as environmental indicators. Many species have biphasic life cycles, meaning they'll have an, an aquatic larval stage and they'll metamorphosize and crawl out onto land for their adult stages. The physiology of amphibians makes them more susceptible to environmental stressors. Many of them do osmoregulate. This means they literally breathe through their skin. So they'll bring in oxygen and respire through their skin. So Andrew covered a lot about Bernheim. What I would like to mention, um, get my pointer here. Um, so Bernheim is located in the Knobs region of the Kentucky, uh, Knobs region of Kentucky. It has really unique geology. There's a lot of uh, rock outcroppings. It is at a higher elevation in the area, approaching 1,100 feet above sea level. And so it does contain many watersheds for the Louisville and uh, Bardstown areas. And it does have more than 40 miles of hiking trails and currently over 500,000 visitors annually. So this map shows Bernheim's border in red. The hiking trails are in brown and the dark blue circles you see denote sample sites where data was collected. We sampled Elm Lick Trail, as you can see here, Jackson Yo Trail and Rock Run Loop from March 2019 through April of 2020. The control site for this project was located about right here um, off of Harrison Fork Road. The GPS point for that was a little bit off. And so just for some reference, I-65 runs north to south here. The Arboretum is in the northwest corner. 245 runs around this way down south in Bardstown. So GPS points were taken for all stream crossings on each trail and then three crossings randomly selected for sampling. Elmlick Trail is a five mile loop, <clears throat> had about 33 water crossings. We sampled Elmlick 2, Elmlick 4, and 5. 4 and 5 were within a few meters of each other and were down in the valley close to Elmlick St. Channel. Elmlick 2 was an upland headwater sea. You can see from this picture, relatively flat terrain. Um, it, was, it was drier than all of the other sites that we sampled at Bernheim. Um, so we do have canopy pictures on most of these. Uh, these are from September, so it gives you an idea that there's a lot of mature forest in this area where we're sampling, a little bit of sunlight percolating through. So Jackson Yo is a two mile loop. Uh, Jackson Yo had 24 water crossings in total. We sampled Jackson Yo 4, shown here on the map, Jackson Yo 18, and Jackson Yo 22. So Jackson Yo 4 and 22 were the most perennial streams sampled at Bernheim, both lying in a wooded valley. Jackson Yo 18 was in an upland, head, an upland headwater seep. 
It had a very wide muddy crossing and it also had trail widening on both sides. So people were traversing to try and get around that mud. Canopy pictures here for Jackson Yo 4 were taken in September. Rock Run Loop is a half a mile loop, encompasses a uh, Rock Run watershed. Rock Run had 14 water crossings. And due to the topography in Rock Run, you can see this picture here in the top center. The sample area below and downstream of the trail was limited. And so we increased the sample size of this trail only to four crossings to accommodate for that limitation. Um, so you can see the main crossing of Rock Run had a wide creek bed had cliffs on either side that were not continuous along the creek bed, um, but some areas were, were pretty tough. So Rock Run 4, um, where's Rock Run 4 is over here. Um, on this side, Rock Run 9 and Rock Run 11 were steep. Um, excuse me. They ran along the top of those cliffs. Rock Run 9 dropped off about two meters below the crossing and rock run four and 11 were steep they joined the main rock run canopy for these rock run 14 was taken in november rock run nine in october and four and 11 were both taken in august so the control for this project was a headwater seep it was isolated from hiking trails and roads we were actually the only foot traffic out there for probably decades um, the top of our sampling area was at this horseshoe shaped cliff or outcropping. It's about five meters high where the stream fell. And generally there was like a line of drips, sometimes a small stream of water coming down. The creek bed was rock based. Um, and our sample area was about a hundred meters or so from the road. So if you look in this picture, you can see um, a gray barn roof in the picture on the left here, that's where the road is. And I don't have any canopy pictures of the controls, so you have mine and Sarah's head here looking at you. All right, so the methods for our project, this is a pretty expansive project. It's gonna take a little bit to go through. A big part of it was focusing on soil erosion. We did use the, the USLE forest soil equation to calculate erosion. Uh, taking a look at this graphic of a trail crossing a stream, the approach of the trail is defined as the length of that trail that drains into the stream. So for this side of the approach, it would start where the slope levels off, and then the approach would be from about this point um, down into the stream. The other approach would start much closer at about this knoll right here. Um, so we measure the slope using a clinometer. It's a handy little gadget here that you look through like a, like a scope and it gives you the angle of that trail. And, and we also calculated the number of steps on each approach, which would be things like roots or rocks that would impede the flow of water into the stream. Percent soil cover of each approach was measured monthly for 14 months. And then we also took soil cores on each trail to determine soil bulk density, which gave us a good idea of how heavily trafficked the trails were. For water quality, we used a HAWC multi-parameter um, measure unit to measure uh, temperature, pH, which is an indicator of how acidic or alkaline the water is, dissolved oxygen, electrical conductivity, which is the amount of ions and minerals and nutrients that are in the water, and also turbidity, which is measured in nephileptic, nephileptic turbidity units. Uh, we used a portable turbidity meter for that. We also collected water samples one meter below the trail and 30 meters above the trail and took those back to the lab for analysis of total suspended solids and volatile suspended solids. And so what this means, total suspended solids is pretty self-explanatory. Things that are suspended in the water column that you can filter out, would filter out, catch it on the filters, um, get the weight of that. This includes things like uh, minerals, um, maybe some soil in there. Uh, volatile suspended solids, we would burn everything off except for carbon and measure what we burned off. So it, it helps a little bit with erosion and calculating clarity of water and things like that. So you can see from the pictures that water did vary greatly across sites from flowing streams. We had small pools that were covered in leaf litter. We had to pull away to even find the water. 
And then sometimes we had drips or seeps that we, you know, might have needed to pipette or collect in a vessel to have enough water quality parameters. So for salamander sampling, all permits were in place before sampling animals to include the federal through USDA Forest Service and also local permits through Bernheim and Kentucky State University's IACUC committee because we were sampling vertebrates. So I'm gonna take you through this graphic here. It depicts our sample site and everything that we did in each location. Um, going from upstream to downstream, and then of course where the trail crossed the stream and working our way up. Water quality was measured at 30, 15, and one meter below the crossing, and then repeated at one, 15, and 30 meters above the crossing. For salamander sampling, we conducted a visual encounter survey along a fixed line transect. So what this means is we took a 10 meter section of the creek and included one meter of each bank. We marked those corners, one was centered at meters below, one was centered at 30 meters above. And we sampled these three transects at each crossing repeatedly. We did set a time limit for 30 minutes to sample each transect. This gives us enough time to get through them all in a weekend. Um, weights <clears throat> for their tail, their snout vent length from the tip of their nose to their venter, which is located just behind the hind legs. The substrate, meaning where they were found under a lock, rog, a log, rock, or leaf litter, or something like that. And their activity, were they resting, swimming, running? We also recorded environmental parameters using a Kestrel environmental meter to determine microclimates for each crossing. And water samples were collected for the environmental DNA portion of this project at the bottom of the lower sampling transect, which was 35 meters below the trail and encompassed the entire sampling area. So we set a timer and go. We're flipping rocks, looking through leaf litter under logs. All salamanders were captured and contained and then measured after the search time ended. We used a spring scale, as you can see here, to record the weight and a dial caliper to record the total length and snout vent length. And then after recording the data, all salamanders were returned to where they were captured. Another sampling of Rock Run. Here's Kristen leaning over Rock Run 9, looking under the ledge and through leaf litter. Um, it's a lot of fun out there. We also sampled for larvae if water was present. So you can see me in the blue hat uh, netting the stream for larvae. They can be extremely small and hard to detect. Uh, you can see in the top two pictures here, some of the larvae of various life stages and, uh, and in relation to the size of fingernail there, very small. So a little bit about the environmental DNA portion of the project. We wanted to collect local DNA samples from each species found at the Bernheim. And for this, we use cutaneous swabbing. So for each species captured, we, uh, the individual was rinsed first with distilled water to remove any contaminants, and then swabbed both dorsally and ventrally using a sterile cotton swab. And then we just stored that swab in uh, microcentrifuge tubes and absolute ethanol to preserve that DNA. So again, for the environmental DNA, we talked about the water samples, one liter water samples from each crossing. Um, we had a total of 88. They were filtered through cellulose nitrate filters. That filter was then dried, cut in half to make a backup sample, and then stored in absolute ethanol at five degrees C, which is refrigerator temperatures until we were able to extract DNA. The DNA was extracted from 88 filters using a DNA, DNA Z blood and tissue kit with a slightly adjusted protocol to better suit environmental DNA. DNA was captured from all filters, which is outstanding. Um, and so basically there's a lot of pictures here, but we would take the filters, they varied. Sometimes we picked up a lot of sediment, sometimes we didn't. We would cut those filters into small pieces um, into the centrifuge tube and then add um, a lysis buffer and proteinase K, and then incubate those samples overnight at 56C 
What this does is it ruptures or lyses the cells and allows the DNA to be released into the solution. And then from there, we just follow the recipe. We add um, a DNA fixing buffer and ethanol, and then we run it through this collection tube. You can see here the collection tube is two piece and there's a membrane here. And so when we run the sample through it, and then we set, we centrifuge to run the liquid through, the liquid gets collected at the bottom, the DNA gets captured in this filter. From there, we go through a couple of steps of washing buffers that wash all of the contaminants and the ethanol away, leaving us only with DNA on that filter. And then from there, we do a DNA releasing buffer that elutes the DNA or, or allows it to pass through this um, membrane and into the collection tube. So we repeat that three times, and then uh, we'll use, so we have, we have the centrifuge here, it just spins the samples and allows it to pass through. So when we're done, we'll take the sample and we wanna measure how much DNA we have in it so we know what we're dealing with. And we use what's called a nano drop. And so on this, you'll see this black circle with a tiny silver dot in the middle. On that dot, you put two microliters, very small, amount of liquid, lower the arm, and then the machine will read off how many nanograms of DNA are in your sample per microliter. And then it also reads sections of DNA that are pertinent to certain uh, species specific parameters. And so, um, so from there, the extracted DNA will be run with real-time qPCR. Uh, the qPCR assay design and analysis will hopefully begin in the coming weeks. It, you know, everything got Put on hold with COVID. So everything now should be really familiar with COVID testing that we're using for this project. So we're going to take known salamander DNA. The primers is what they're called, a section of salamander DNA specific to a particular species, and we'll run them against the extracted DNA to determine the species presence or absence at a particular site or time, in addition to quantifying the DNA for each species identified. So this isn't going to tell us how many individuals are present, but it will allow us to calculate the percent of the total species identified. And from there, we can compare it to the results of our physical sampling. So the objectives for this project, we're basically looking at hiking trail stream crossings to be able to determine if soil erosion rates are affecting water quality and habitat below the crossing and of salamander populations and or diversity are affected. So let's jump into the results. Uh, statistics were run using JMP software. Uh, we started out with one way ANOVAs, uh, looking at the USLE forest. Um, just a little bit of, of definition here. The erosion is, everything is reported in metric. Erosion is reported in megagrams per hectare per year. So what does that mean? Well, a megagram is about 2.2 pounds. A hectare is just under two and a half acres. So one megagram per hectare per year is approximately a half a ton per acre per year. In comparison, an undisturbed forest is gonna have soil erosion that's less than one megagram per hectare per year. So we did find significant differences both between trails here on the right and within trails. Rock Run 9 and Rock Run 14 crossings reported the highest erosion overall and the control reported the lowest erosion well within that undisturbed forest parameter. So it should be noted that the only reason the control reported a value greater than zero was because traversing the steepness of the banks <clears throat> to measure the percent soil cover resulted in one slip of the foot that exposed soil and caused a value less than 100%. But you can see in A denotes the highest and then subsequent alphabetical letters drop in value from there. So Rock Run has significantly higher erosion followed by Jackson Yo, followed by Elm Lick and the control had the lowest erosion overall at Bernheim. So this graph shows you a lot of what we just talked about, shows you variations between crossings uh, with Rock Run 9 and 14 having the highest erosion rates overall. So some 
sometimes it's easier to just visualize a graph and look at a bunch of numbers. Erosion was first calculated by approach. Each crossing has two approaches, remember that graphic? And then average per crossing and per trail. So you can see there's a lot of variation between approaches and crossings. Elm Lake 5 approach 2 uh, drained away from the stream crossing and so has no value. Jackson Yo 18 2 approach 2 had a slope of zero and very low erosion. And the control again had no erosion outside of my one slip recording data. But even in Rock Run, you can see Rock Run 14, one approach was really high erosion, another approach was pretty low, comparable to the other sites at Bernheim. Overall, the percent soil cover of the trails at Bernheim is really good. The yearly averages of crossings, the lowest was 71, highest was 100. Um, and so this is good news for Bernheim. And I'm gonna go through pretty quickly some graphs, but I wanted you guys, this is Elmlick crossing two and crossing four and five. Just to show you over the course of the year, what the soil erosion earned the soil, what the percent soil drop in the fall on most of the crossings uh, boosts the cover to nearly 100%. And, and you can see some fluctuations over the course of the year. These can be caused by rain, wind, hikers, even wildlife displacing and then redistributing leaf litter over time. These are Jackson Yo crossing four, 18 and 22. Jackson Yo had the lowest overall soil cover with Jackson Yo 22 getting down below 20%. Most of the other crossing lows were around 40%. And Rock Run crossings, again, Rock Run 4, 9, 11, and 14, showing that stabilization in the fall um, and winter with the leaf drop. And this is also a time when there are fewer hikers on the trails displacing the leaf litter. So moving on to water quality. Water quality data was analyzed first using a one-way ANOVA with the Tukey's mean comparison. We saw no significant differences in dissolved oxygen between trails, but there were all other water quality parameters, significantly higher than other trails. Temperature is only significantly different between Jackson Yo and Rock Run. Rock Run, of course, had the highest temperature, had the most rock uh, with the cliffs and the, and the creek beds. And then <clears throat> for conductivity, <clears throat> Rock Run had significantly higher conductivity. Um, well, the control and Rock Run had significantly higher conductivity than Elmlick and, and Jackson Yo. And this was due to the many underground springs at these two locations. So underground water is going to have higher conductivity. It's going to have higher mineral content uh, for percolating through the soil and the rock than surface water, which is generally much lower. And you're looking at some of our conductivity measurements uh, were in the 700s and 800s, and surface water can be below 100, 125 in that range. So looking at humidity, uh, TSS and VSS, they were all lowest at the control and highest at Jackson Yo. We saw no significant differences in VSS between trails, TSS, when compared to other trails. Jackson Yo's high levels are partly due to Jackson Yo 18 being a wide, muddy crossing, but also because the crossings, all the crossings in Jackson Yo are in a valley where sediment deposition occurs. And you can see there's a lot of siltation here. There was an algal bloom at Jackson Yo 4 in April, lasted about two weeks. And the crossings in Jackson Yo all get very muddy during wetter times of the year. So just breaking it down a couple of parameters um, by crossing. Uh, uh, this is looking at conductivity. And so did see significant differences in conductivity within both Elmlick and Jackson Yo, but not at Rock Run. So turbidity, there are significant differences with, uh, seen within all trails. Uh, the control again had the lowest reported turbidity. Jackson Yo 18 had the highest due to its wide muddy crossing. So we wanted to know, you know, how erosion is affecting water quality below the trail crossing, if at all. You know, can we look at certain water quality parameters that are influenced by erosion? 
to be able to predict crossings with higher erosion rates? Is there an easier way than calculating a soil loss equation? And so for this, we used a multiple regression with a backward elimination to find a best fitting model. So this basically means that we ran a statistical model that compared erosion against all water quality parameters. And then we just removed one parameter at a time <clears throat> having the highest p-value continuing until we found this model here. Um, and this shows that uh, temperature and depth are significantly related to erosion. DO is influenced by erosion, but not significantly. So taking this, we then ran a three-way ANOVA. We did find, uh, we, the three-way ANOVAs ran with temperature, um, dissolved oxygen, and depth. And we did find no significant differences uh, between trails, but we did find significant differences within trails. And you can see from this table here, uh, they do vary a little bit. Um, but temperature was more of a factor overall than the other two parameters. And rock run, in order for something to be signif statistically significant, the p-value has to be less than 0 0.05. So this is very close, but not statistically significant. All of our crossings changed dramatically during the course of the study period. Streams dried up in mid to late summer. They did hold water most of the winter and early spring. And as you saw in that little video, they raged at times, making streams impossible to cross. This is Rock Run 4. Um, and if you guys out there that have been on Rock Run, most of the time those are dry. You may have a little bit of water run on them. I couldn't cross this with mud, with mud boots on. So during heavy, uh, heavy rain events, approaches, even approaches, the approach to Rock Run 14 became a watershed. So a couple of events that changed the study areas enlarged down trees. One was at Jackson Yo 22 in November that changed the stream channel 30 meters above the trail crossing. This created a dam that accumulated feet of leaf litter. And you can see Sarah here, just to give you a perspective of how big that tree was and, and kind of gives you an idea of the impact. The other was a white oak that was uprooted by wind at Elm Lake 5. It completely covered the stream from 15 meters below across the trail to one meter above. Fortunately, this happened in April, our last sample month, so it didn't affect the overall data collection of the project. So moving on to the beloved salamanders. We did find a total of 13 species and 218 individuals at the Bernheim. Most of our sampling was done during the day. Um, had we done nocturnal sampling at night, we could have easily quadrupled this number. A lot of salamanders are on the surface, they're nocturnal, they're out feeding in the daytime, they're trying to stay away from the sun, they're undercover, they're harder to find. <clears throat> so 45% of the salamanders found were Eurycia cerigera or the Northern Two Line, and they were found at all four sites. Eurycia longicata, or the long tail, was second on the list at almost 24%, but was not found at Elm Lick. Pethodon dorsalis, or the zigzag, was third on the list at almost 12%. And both the zigzag and the ravine salamander, Plethodon richmondi, here, number five, they were not recorded at Jackson Yo. Nodophthalmus viridescence, uh, only at the control, no other trails. And then number six was Plethodon glutinosus, the slimy salamander. This was only found at Elm Lick and Rock Run. So a little bit on conservation status. Uh, the Northern Dusky salamander, the redback, and the stream side are all listed on the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife as species of conservation need. So we didn't capture four toed salamanders, but there is a small chance we'll pick up their presence in the eDNA analysis. So this graphic here shows you the classification from critically imperiled to secure, and there are global statuses um, and state statuses listed on the Department of Fish and Wildlife. <laughs> Excuse me. The redback is listed as a vulnerable species, S3. And the stream side and the four toed are in better shape, but their populations are still not secure. So looking at the total number of salamanders captured, 
we did find the most salamanders at the control when compared to all the other crossings and the least found at Elm Lick. No salamanders were found at Jackson Yo 18. One was found at Elm Lick 2, and two were found at Rock Run Crossing number nine. And so you can see there are some significant differences uh, between Rock Run 14 um, had higher numbers of salamanders than Rock Run 9, but no difference between Rock Run 4 and 11. So this is a big table, but it shows you all of the species and where they were found across the crossings and trails. Um, <clears throat> the number, uh, uh, sorry. So Eurystheus serigera, the Northern Two Line was the only species found at every single crossing <clears throat> and every single trail at Bernheim. All the other ones were a lot more localized, like the red aft was only found at the control. Some were not found at Jackson Yo, but other trails, et cetera. So along the bottom, we have the total number of individuals. Um, and this is broken down by crossing, but by trail, we had 51 found at the control. Elm Lick, we found 26 individuals. We found 59 individuals at Jackson Yo and 82 individuals at Rock Run. So for the number of species, diver the species diversity, the number of species found at Elm Lick, uh, or at the control was six. <clears throat> Elm Lick, we had a total of four species found across three, tra uh, three crossings. Jackson Yo, we found seven species, and Rock Run, we found nine species. So there was more salamander diversity at both Rock Run and Jackson Yo than at the control. And this is great news as both Rock Run and Jackson Yo are really popular trails, and it doesn't seem to be hindering the salamander diversity there. So one of our big questions was, are we finding fewer salamanders below the stream crossing? So these two graphs look at the different transects that we sample below the trail, at the trail, the mid, and above the trail. So for the total number of salamanders captured, the trend here says, yes, there is a difference, but you know the total number of salamanders was not significantly different between crossings. However, it, there are significant differences seen in larvae captured between the transect that was at the trail stream crossing and the one above, uh, but not the transects below. So breaking down the number of individuals within trail transects. So each of these, we have the control, the above, mid, below transect. We have Elm Lake Trail, Jackson Hill Rock Run. Um, there are no significant differences when you look at the trail as a whole but you can see the variation between transects. For example, at the control, we found the most salamanders at the above transect, and we found the most salamanders at Elm Lick in the below transect. So of course, a lot of this has to do with moisture and water being present more in one transect than another. So breaking it down even further by crossing, this is Elm Lick 4, 5, Elm Lick 2 here, um, this shows the most salamanders found at Elm Lick 5 in the below, but still no significant differences. This is Jackson Yo crossing 4 and 22, no significant differences within crossings. Again, you see that variation, you know, Jackson Yo had the most below the, the trail and Jackson Yo, or Jackson Yo 4. And Jackson Yo 22, we found the most salamanders above the trail. So this is Rock Run, crossings 4, 9, 11, and 14. And the only significant differences we saw within trails was at Rock Run 14, where the above transect had significantly more salamanders found when compared to the transect below the trail. So this is what we expected to see at more of the crossings that would support the hypothesis that hiking trails were impacting habitat downstream from these trail crossings. So this is really good news for recreational forestry and good news for Bernheim that we only saw this at one crossing and we're not seeing this widespread impact. So it is good to note that identification can sometimes be tricky as there's a lot of diversity and variation within certain species. So if we couldn't figure out the species, we would just take a ton of pictures and then see it out later. 
Uh, so this slide shows zigzag diversity. It's notoriously tricky in color and pattern variations. And it includes a leadback variety that has no zigzag stripe. And so that leadback variety is almost impossible to distinguish from another leadback variety of Plethodon cinaris or the redback salamander. So the zigzag colors varied from a nice dark red, uh, could be a burnt oak on the stripe. The young individuals uh, showed the highest variation. The salamander here was almost black. It only had a few visible spots under high light and so flash very helpful. Uh, when, when we first found the salamander, I thought it was a ravine. It was all black, had a few. The long tail salamander had tails, and their tails tend to be longer than their bodies. Um, we did find one juvenile long tail in October. And so if you take a look at this salamander found in June, um, and see that it has a recently regrown tail. So there's a line right here, there's a color differentiation where something tried to catch it and it dropped part of its tail segment and regrew it. We did see, you know, many different individuals captured that had pieces of a tail missing, the entire tail missing. We could see where it had been regrown. Some were missing a toe, um, you know, but salamanders are really cool. They have the capacity to regrow lost limbs and tails. It takes them a little bit, it takes a lot of energy, but they can do it. So colors on the long tail varied from this nice bright yellow. Uh, we found some that were more orangish yellow, and there was a couple here that were almost black. They had such heavy markings on them. We also saw variation in the two line salamander. They were drab olive to brown to yellow, but two lines all have a bright yellow belly making identification easy. And also in the few caves we found, you can see the variation of both color and pattern. And we were lucky enough to find gravid females at Elm Lake 5 in both January and February. And here you can see these white dots. Those are eggs developing inside that female, super cool. And the cloaca we talked about, snout vent length, that's that indentation there located just behind the hind legs. Streamside salamanders did vary a lot, of course, from juveniles and right here with a lot of blue flecking um, to the adults, more drab, but really, really beautiful salamander there. Uh, the juvenile did look a lot like a Jefferson's. We had to do some digging and consult the experts to realize that it wasn't a Jefferson's. Um, it doesn't have those long hind toes. And we also have the northern red. We found one or two larvae here, gild larvae, very olive drab in color. Uh, juvenile on the bottom that was pretty much neon orange and then an orca red. So notice the uh, characteristic mustache of spots around the mouth that distinguishes the red salamander from both the spring and the mud. So here's an interesting uh, slide for you guys. This is an example of a food web. Food webs um, generally have dozens and dozens of species. I just have a few listed here. And I'll just give you a quick run through what happens in a food web. The sun feeds the primary producers, which are the plants. Those plants then feed the primary consumers, which then feed the secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. Quaternary consumers are at the top of the food chain, otherwise known as top predators. Um, there's a lot of interactions between these species, but ultimately all dead organic material is then decomposed by various species um, from arthropods to worms, bacteria, fungi. everything is connected. Salamanders are about in the middle, but dusky in here. Um, they'll eat just about anything they can fit into their mouths, including insects, other arthropods, worms, even other salamanders and they are an important food source for many other forest animals. So a quick note about Kentucky climate. These data were uh, taken from a mesonet station at the Bernheim. We had a very dry summer and fall, but then a consistently wet winter and spring. These, this is over the sample period of our project. 
Dunstan in Kentucky came into the 30s centigrade, which is in the mid 90s in the summer, and then generally dipped to freezing in winter months. And then we also have high relative humidity. Anybody that lives here knows that well enough. Our low averages in the 40 percentile range. So over the course of the year, we did notice the human impact. Hikers tend to go off trail a lot, especially at Rock Run in Jackson Yo. Hikers traverse the creek as much as they did the trail. You know, there's a lot of species that take refuge under rocks and logs, and this can have a big impact. We flipped this large rock to find a dead blue-tailed skink, poor little guy right here, crushed when a hiker used the rock as a stepping stone. So, you know, when we started this project, we were like a lot of other hikers, we just hiked. We used the stepping stones to stay out of the mud, to stay out of the water. You know, and after we saw all of the life that harbors under these cover objects, you know, we stepped in the water after that. We used the mud. We, we avoided these large cover objects. We want to protect the life there. We also saw a lot of uh, rock cairns, mostly on rock run. And so these rock stacks, they really disturb natural habitat. Um, they can actually crush individuals and they can change water flow patterns. So, you know, this is important to note that if you're doing this, please stop. Um, and one other little quick note here, I was measuring turbidity one day, rock run nine in May. See the levels are pretty low. And then a hiker walked past me and stepped in the water that I was sampling. I pull a sample out and turbidity was increased from 0 0.43 over 100 with one foot step. Of course, that's gonna settle out, but it just gives you an idea of the impact that, that we could be causing. So in summary, we do see differences where salamanders are found in relation to hiking trails, but the only significant differences were with the larvae. Species are very localized. Some of them only move a few feet or even less in their entire lives. Um, you know, they do have very preferred habitats. They're very um, specific, some of them. Some of them are more general, like the two line. Um, there are significant differences in both water quality and erosion that we're gonna do some further analysis on. And of course, management recommendations, Andrew and I have already talked about this and it's already been addressed. It's causing the higher erosion. And as anybody has known that has done research, projects like this could not be possible without the dedication of so many people. So Leo and Michaela, um, you know, for their expertise and identification, these guys taught us so much. And Sarah, Jara, Nicole, and Kristen for their support and unabated love for the natural world. I even drug my daughter Kaj out. You know, she helped on a lot of water quality weekends. So there's just so much appreciation for everyone that stepped up and volunteered their time. And I just want to thank everybody for showing up and I appreciate your attention. And I think we have about 10 minutes or more, we can open it up for discussion. So I'm going to... Yep, anyone has any questions, if they wanna type it in the chat box or if they wanna um, unmute themselves, that's fine too. But um, Jill and Andrew are available for um, questions. So Jill, I'll, I'll uh, just first, let me say thank you so much for the presentation. This is great work. Um, it, it, this is the kind of stuff that really helps Bernheim. When we, when we go to design a trail or when we, we go to, to figure out how we're going to put humans into these sensitive environments, you know, this is the kind of information that really helps us to do that uh, in a thoughtful and, uh, and responsible way so that we don't impact some of the, the least seen and, and overlooked critters like the, uh, the salamanders. Um, so at Bernheim, you sure. know, we're really focused on the present, but also we're really focused on the future. And unfortunately now I've been thinking in like, you know, decades or even centuries down the, down the uh, road. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the threats that salamanders are gonna be facing um, over the coming decades or some of the coming or some of the threats that we're seeing right now coming in the United States? Sure. Um, so there is a chytrid fungus that has really been released from the pet trade. People get amphibians. They don't realize the commitment that's involved. They'll let them go into the environment. 
Um, this is pretty much spread worldwide. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it's not yet been found at Bernheim. It has been found um, definitely in the Gorge area of Kentucky and a lot of other areas. So it's really causing rapid decline of all amphibian species across the globe. One of the biggest threats to salamanders and other amphibians is habitat destruction. You know, as the human population increases, you need more houses, you need more farmland, and they're taking down more forests. I mean, just look at the rainforest. It's just being decimated to, you know, grow cattle and crops. So the, the biggest risk is habitat destruction. And, you know, for Bernheim, protecting the headwaters, protecting the forest, encouraging mature trees, creating like the perfect habitat for salamanders to really thrive. You got any other questions from anybody? You can type them into the chat box or, or feel free to unmute yourself and just ask them. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. So, so Jill, you mentioned that you had uh, found 13 species of salamanders. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that is correct. And I That's think a, uh, so. What, Oh, sorry. When we started this project, you gave me a list that had 12 species on it, if I remember right. I remember mm -hmm. adding one species, but I'm not exactly sure which one I added. I think it was the spring or maybe the mud. I can't remember. I think it was the spring salamander. Um, and, and also I'll mention, um, I don't think you found the, the four-toed salamander. Is that right? I did not. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah, the four toed is uh, it's one of those yeah, they're very, they're those very rare salamanders only found in the upland ponds at Bernheim and just a just a couple of, of isolated locations. Um, so it's it's not surprising you didn't find that since you weren't sampling any of the upland ponds, but to find all of the others um, and yeah. then also the spring salamander, I thought that that was a pretty incredible feat. And I want to commend you on that because that's one of the things that Bernheim looks at. We've got these species lists that go back over 90 years, but you, you look at those species lists and you wonder, you know, particularly for like the birds or some of these reptiles, are all of those species still represented in Bernheim? And for you to come out and do mm -hmm. your project and to, and to find all of them that were on our list and then add to that, that's, that's really incredible. That's exciting. So, yeah. yeah, very exciting. Yeah, and I, so, so, I, you I, know, Right. Some of the species, you know, according to certain maps, it's, it's hard to find a good map with distribution, you know, especially in the state of Kentucky. So you're compiling lists from other areas. Um, and some of the species, you know, were not recorded or not documented in lists to be, um, to show that they were, they should have been found in the area. Right, we're on, I think the zigzag, maybe we're on the southern end of that. Most of the northern zigzags are in like Ohio and, and in the northeast a little bit. And so some of the some of what we found was actually extending the, the known range for it, which is really pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, and we did, you know, I was in the forest two weekends a month for over a year. And so you really get to know the streams, you get to know the life, um, you see how that forest changes over the course of the year. And I mean, like I have so many pictures we found, I mean, you're, we're flipping all of this cover, we're finding millipedes and all kinds of cool snakes and spiders and frogs. And there's just like so much diversity, wildflowers, mushrooms. Like I could do a whole presentation just on the forms of life that we found, so was Bernheim is a special place. Anybody that's been there definitely knows that. For sure. Uh, so we've got a question in the chat box. Um, how can homeowners create or encourage salamanders in a non-natural setting? <sighs> I think the biggest thing that you can do as a homeowner is to plant native species. Um, don't be so tidy, leave the mess, leave the leaves, 
You know, if you like a small lawn, keep your lawn, rake the leaves into your beds, leave things undisturbed, leave those cover objects, leave logs, leave, leave places for them to hide, you know, make sure your soil's covered. Um, it helps it to keep moist, it helps, um, helps the biodiversity, it helps build your soil. And, you know, the more, um, the more that you leave it alone, the more diversity that's gonna grow out of that. So if you're continually in there cleaning and weeding and mulching and spraying, you know, stop using chemicals, just leave it alone. That's, that's my advice. Remove invasive species to the best of your ability um, and, and encourage, you know, so if you wanna encourage or amphibians, you know, shade trees would be good or areas that, you know, maybe a small pond or a bog area, um, you have to give them a moist habitat. Yep. And, and you mentioned the cover boards, you know, it's around my place. I live out in the country and, you know, stuff accumulates around the edge of the yard, you know, some debris or, or maybe logs have fallen okay. over some old boards and, and you'll go to move those late in the winter, or early in the spring. And, you know, that's when I find some of the coolest stuff, you know, is under those boards. So oh, yeah. something you all can do for a homeowner, if you all have some old wood, boards um you know if you want to lay those out near a stream or a wet area and then have those as your own personal cover boards that you can come back and check um you know bernheim's got researchers that use tin um sheets for snakes and then we also use wood often for salamanders so those are some good things you can do just to find out what you got around your house and you might really be surprised because as the salamanders start migrating in this early spring and we're not that far away from salamanders start migrating to some of these upland pools. Um, you know, you, you, you never know. You might have a spotted salamander or something in your yard. It'd be pretty cool. That would be pretty um, cool. That would be. So I, I think we're about at seven o'clock. And unless anybody has any other questions, they want to jump in really quick. Um, I would like to give a big round of applause to Jill Fisk. <laughs> um, Thanks, congratulate her on her her successful years of research at Bernheim and um, and hope her the best in finishing up her master's at Kentucky State University. Thank you, Jill. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Yep, yep. It was Jill and Andrew. And and um, and we'll stay in touch. If y'all got any other questions about salamanders or any else, anything else Bernheim related, just let us know. We're always glad to talk about it. Absolutely. Everybody have a great night. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.